Welcome to another moment in the Word. How is it that when Jesus was born, the angels of heaven, Gabriel leading them, would say peace on earth and goodwill toward men? And yet Jesus would say, you think I've come to bring peace? I tell you, nay, I come to bring a sword. How is it that the division Jesus causes actually brings peace? Well, we're looking at a passage that will explain that. We're looking at John chapter 9, chapter 10, verse 19 down to 21. And it reads like this. There was a division, therefore, among the Jews for these sayings. And many of them said, He has a demon, and he is mad. Why do you hear him? Others said, These are not the words of him who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? In the English, it begins with the word therefore. It doesn't exist in the Greek, however. In fact, the first word in the Greek is the word division. Division, it's very important. It's emphatic. It's emphasized. There was a division. Now, why was that division? Because Jesus had just said that he had come to do the will of the Father, that he was coming to live lay down his life, that he was coming to lay down his life for his sheep, and he would take it up again, that he would resurrect. And the last words that he would say prior to this verse, that is in verse 18, is, this is the commandment I received of my Father. He's equating himself now with the Father in intimacy that no prophet in the Old Testament ever attributed to themselves. Jesus is claiming to be God, and he has done that consistently. He will do it again in this same chapter, chapter 10 of John, verse 30, where he will say, I and the Father are one. Now there was division. That word division is a very interesting word. The word in the Greek is schizo. So you have the word schizophrenia, schism. Those words all come from that word. It means to divide, to tear, to rent. And if you hear that, then you may remember this passage. It was when Jesus was on the cross, and he cries with a loud voice, giving up his spirit. This is in Matthew. It's in chapter 27. It's verses 50 and 51. And it reads like this. After he cried with a loud voice. He yielded up the spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn. Schizo, the same word. And from the top to the bottom, it was torn. In other words, God tore it, allowing then entrance into the holy of holies, not just for the high priest, not just for the priests, but for everyone. The centurion saw it, and said, Behold, this is God. Now, it goes on. That's not the end of the verse. This is verse 20, 51 of, of chapter 27 in Matthew. And it says, And the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. That word is schizo. It's the same word. There was a division. Christ brings division in the earth. Why is that? Well, because of who he is. The very nature of God is that he is holy, and his holiness exposes that which is not holy. In the very beginning, we saw that in him was life, and the life was the light of men. But it goes on to say that the light so exposed the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it, did not overcome it. In fact, it's always light that overcomes darkness. It's always truth that exposes the lie, the deceitfulness of Satan. It's always love that overcomes hatred. But hatred is exposed by love. When you see that on the cross, the hatred toward Christ as the, he was crucified, and yet the concern that he has for his mother the concern that he has for the thief that is next to him, and the concern that he has as he prays for all, Father, forgive them. The love exposes the hate, and there's the division. And now we find there was a division among them, 
And now, who is them? Who is the? Who are the Jews? Remember, in this passage, he had been talking to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the ones that said in the end of chapter 9, are we blind? And Jesus responds by giving them then a metaphor. He gives them a, not a story, but an allegory telling that he is the one who is the shepherd who is the door protecting the sheep. They don't get that. John expresses that in verse 6 and says that they still don't understand. Jesus becomes more direct, more direct and decisive in explaining them what to them what he is saying. And as they hear that, they become ter disturbed even more. But it's not just the Jews, the, the Pharisees. It's also those that are with them. The word Jews is Judah. It is having reference to those who are in the nation of Judah. And that means all of the crowd, though Jesus had been speaking to the Pharisees, the crowd that was there from Jerusalem and from all of Judea, and his disciples. And it's again. And it means that this isn't the first time there was a division. In fact, this is the fifth time there was a division which recorded in the Gospel of John. We saw it in chapter 6, where Jesus had described himself as the bread of life. And that he had just fed 5,000 men and their families, 20, 30,000 people. And Jesus had described that he is the bread of life and that in order to have life, we must eat of him. And the Jews, therefore, they were quarreled. This is verse 52 of chapter 6. They quarreled, quarreled among themselves and saying, how can this man give his flesh to us to eat? There was a division. And then we see it again in verse 60. This is just a few verses later. And Jesus further elaborates, and he makes it emphatic. You must identify with him. We who are Christians, we celebrate the Lord's table. We celebrate communion. It is that where we identify with him who identify with us, his broken body as the broken bread, his blood that was shed in the cup that we drink of. We identify with him. But as a result in verse 60, we find this is a hard saying. Who can stand it was stated by many of those who heard. And then we find in chapter 7 and verse 43 that there was a division among the people because of him because they weren't sure where he was from. Jesus had said, he had come from heaven, that he had come into the world, that his life didn't begin at Bethlehem. It didn't begin here on earth. He was not like the rest of us, that he is eternal. And there was a division again among them. And then in chapter 9 and verse 16, there were some of the Pharisees and they said, this man is not from God. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. And so, consequently, there was a division. There was a division among them because others said, well, how could a sinner do all of these signs? It was clear that Jesus is who he claimed to be, and that is God. But that caused a division, and it causes a division today. Even today, the big issue about Christianity is Christ, and who is Jesus? If we deny that he has come in the flesh and think that he's merely a myth, then we then fall in the category of what we see in John, 1 John, chapter 4, and verses 1 through 3. And that is that everyone that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of the Antichrist. In other words, is in alignment with Satan, denying that God has become flesh. He took on the likeness of man. So now there was a division, but notice the division. He goes on to say, because of his sayings. The word sayings, I wish they had translated as they normally translate the word logos. And that is the word. It is the word that divides. 
Always before, you will find it was what he did, his miracles, his signs. Now it's what he's saying. It's the word that divides. That's what happened in the garden. It's the word that divides. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, it says, For the word of God is living, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic, a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The very nature of the word is that it divides. It divides even within us. As you read and meditate on the word every day, it's cutting deep. And that is if you allow it. And as you allow it, it exposes your motives, your thoughts, your intents, and whether or not they are aligned with what God purposes. But Jesus is the Word who became flesh. So now we find the response, and the response is found in verse 20. Many, and the word polis is the word for much, it's great in number. Many, the majority of them, they said he has a demon. And demonian is the word for demon. It is one who is of the devil. He is aligned with the devil. And he is mad. And the word mad is the word in the Greek that you get your word maniac from. That he is not only spiritually aligned with Satan, but that he is crazy. Now, why would they say that? When Jesus exposes the heart, and the heart is resistant to what Jesus is saying, which is the truth, then either we argue and they had tried and were unsuccessful, or else they discount him as the very worst that he could possibly be, and that is a demon. And as a result, they say, why would you listen? Akuo is again the Greek word, acoustics. And that is where Jesus had said previously, my sheep, a kuo, they hear my voice. It is if we listen, if our hearts are meek and that we are open to receive the word of God, then we expose ourselves as one of his sheep. And if we resist his word and we discount Jesus as merely a crazy man, or we dis discount him as a demon, then our pride and our arrogance, our sinfulness blinds us. And that is precisely what Jesus had said, is that he has come to heal those who are blind and admit their blindness that they might see. But those who think they see, they will remain blind. Now others... And that's what we find in verse 31, uh, 21. And that is, that wasn't the whole of the group. There were others, alos, which means that they are one of the same, but different, that they have separated themselves. And they say, these are not the words. Now, the word here is not logos, it's rima. And the word rima is specific. It is referring to actual statements rather than general content. It is referring to the specific words that Jesus said. These are not the rima, the words, the statements of one who has a demon. And then they say, and the word ken in the Greek is dunamai. It is the word you get your English word dynamite from, having the power can a demon, does a demon have the power to open the eyes of the blind? No, why not? Because demons do destructive things. Remember, they come to steal, to destroy, and to kill. It is Christ, it is God who gives life. And if demons don't have the power to do good, they have only the power to do evil. Jesus said, can an evil tree produce good fruit? A demon can't do what Jesus did. He, in the beginning of chapter 9, 
healed a man that was born blind and now sees. He has taken your life, and you look at what you were before Christ, B.C., and now look at where you are and how you've changed, and you ask, is it a demon that does that? No. Demons always bring darkness, not light. They always bring destruction, not creation. They always bring death, not life. They always bring hatred, not love. Jesus has come that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. So the question is, is Jesus a demon to you? Is he delusion to you? Or is he Lord to you? Is he your Savior? Is he your God? Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you that it is the truth that exposes error, but it's also the truth that sets us free. And we pray, Father, if there's any listening that have been lost and have been wondering and questioning and, and Father, not certain what is right and who is right, that they might know that there is only one that is right, and that is you. And that you have come in the flesh, in the person of Jesus, and exposed what is true and what is the word, that we might have life and have it abundantly. We pray, Father, that each of us who do not know Christ might repent of our sin and acknowledge that Jesus' blood on the cross cleanses us. As Christians, Father, might we not only believe, but also proclaim Jesus as Lord to those that we meet. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen.